20 years ago, here on the land of Semipalatinsk, the last nuclear explosion died down on one of the largest nuclear test sites in the world. In total, 456 nuclear tests were carried out on our land and their aggregate power exceeded by two and a half thousand times the power of the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima, whilst radiation rates were higher than at Chernobyl. Two decades have already passed since that historical date, but we still feel that irreparable damage was caused to our nation. The people that survived the nuclear tests and, what is more terrible, their children continue to experience the tragic consequences of the tests. The total number of our citizens exposed to radiation exceeded one million during the years of testing. The drama of nuclear test sites is the drama of the entire Kazakh land. The trauma caused to our ecology is so serious that its restoration will, according to what scientists tell us, take centuries. The Semipalatinsk nuclear test site was established by a decision of the Council of Ministers of the Soviet Union on 21st of August 1947. Eighteen and a half thousand square kilometers of land were withdrawn from all use for nuclear experiments. Here, in absolute and deep secrecy, large-scale construction had started on testing grounds, underground bunkers, and scientific laboratories. The nuclear test site stretched out into the regions of Semipalatinsk, Pavlodar, and Karaganda. It was necessary to find a suitable, sort of deserted site, which at the same time would be easily accessible for us. This was not so easy. From the site where the first tests were intended to take place, Semipalatinsk was far away enough, about 150 kilometers away. Apart from Semipalatinsk, there were other little regional centers that were much closer to the site. Actually, even now, I cannot think of a place that would be more suitable for the purpose. How can the existence of a sizable regional center, Semipalatinsk, only 150 kilometers from the nuclear test site, with a population of several hundred thousand citizens, not be a good enough reason to search for a more deserted area. There were dozens of completely empty lands in the territory of the Soviet Union. And how big should the number of people be so that they are not sacrificed to this cause? How can the one life of a single human ever be less valuable than the wish to save on a couple of hundred kilometers of railway track. And yet, on the 29th of August, 1949, the first nuclear test was performed at the Semipalatinsk nuclear test site. Did scientists and the military consider the consequences following the nuclear tests when observing the horrific images of nuclear explosions? Could they ever imagine all the pain they would cause to the people and the land of Kazakhstan? Most probably, the people commissioning the explosions were perfectly aware of the horrific consequences of their actions. In fact, all the data collected by scientists during the tests are still classified top secret. However, even the fragments of information that are being disclosed by specialists make it clear that many generations of Kazakhstani people will hear echoes from the Semipalatinsk test site. 
explosions were in salt massifs, and salt, as you know, compresses under high pressure and temperature and creates cavities. 1,200,000 cavities under the ground resulted from the explosions. Areas of land adjacent to Semipalatinsk have suffered from the effects of radiation of nuclear attacks hundreds of times, and so did the population. Water basins and centuries-old pastures for cattle grazing were contaminated. A great amount of radionuclides accumulated in milk, meat, vegetables and fruits. By eating them, people suffered from compounded effects of radiation. И до нас, конечно, доходили сведения и приходили письма о том, что вокруг Семипалатинска не все благополучно со здоровьем людей. Of course, we did receive information, and letters were received that there were problems with people's health in the area of Semipalatinsk, that people died because of radiation. We were very concerned with this information, and we established a small delegation, in which I also took part, as the chairperson of the Soviet Committee for Peace Protection. And we went to the site just for familiarization. I went directly to one of the major chiefs and told him that our Soviet Committee for Peace had a great request, based on the demands of people who wrote letters to us, to inform them how many people had died due to radiation around this test site. But he replied he had to look at it and consult. Of course, he did not give me any data. I received nothing. But from conversations with various people of approximately the same status as this official, I finally got a shocking answer. I was told, we have no statistics. We have no idea how many people died. We have not kept such statistics. Мы понятия не имеем, сколько погибло. Не вели статистику. So we worked together with our uh, Kazakhstani counterparts to physically seal up and close the nuclear weapons test tunnels in the Daeglin Mountain uh, uh, area of the test site. We had some advice from Russian specialists who uh, knew a lot of the secrets that uh, were not uh, that went back to Moscow after the breakup of the Soviet Union. Um, we spent a lot of time ensuring that this was done safely because of the potential uh, contamination from radiation. Well, I, I had the opportunity to visit the epicenter of the uh, nuclear weapons test site with uh, my Kazakhstani colleagues, but also with some of the uh, Russian experts who had actually been responsible for conducting the tests. And uh, it's still, um, because of the uh, contamination left behind from the above ground test, it's still a uh, uh, somewhat in, in certain what we call hot spots, there's a, a high enough uh, level of uh, radioactivity that it will uh, never, uh, should never be used for any uh, um, commercial activity or mining. It is difficult to choose the right words to describe the shocking damage which was caused by nuclear tests to the environment and to the health of the Kazakhstani people. During the first 14 years of tests of open explosions of uranium, hydrogen and plutonium bombs above and below ground, there was not one measure taken to protect the population from radiation neither were any medical examinations conducted. When I saw Semipalatinsk, um, I, did not, I was not surprised by anything. Uh, much of the radiation at Semipalatinsk had uh, dissipated over a period of time because of the half-life, but there were hot spots in various uh, areas uh, right close to, to ground zero locations. Uh, but the damage was, was enormous and the impact on the people um, there was, was great. It is very difficult to estimate the epidemiological impact of radiation on people because it takes place over such a long period of time. You know, from my perspective and from the perspective of Green Cross and Global Green, 
This has been an enormous uh, environmental and public health crisis in the world. Uh, we still don't know all the full consequences of radioactivity, high rates of radioactivity, but with the atmospheric testing of, of fission and fusion bombs in the last 50 years, uh, we really have produced uh, very dangerous amounts of radioactivity. And I think years and decades from now, we'll know better how this has impacted cancer rates and in the environment and in our genetics over time. But it's something that we need to correct. In addition to evident congenital defects, cases of oncologic and cardiovascular diseases, such as leukemia and nervous system disorders, became more frequent in people living near the nuclear test site. Mortality rates increased. However, medical specialists were forbidden to diagnose diseases associated with radiation exposure. And people were treated for all diseases except the ones from which they were dying. Conversely to official statements made by scientists and the military, nuclear tests were not harmless, either for the environment or for the health of the population. The Soviet nuclear engineers knew that detonations of big charges would leave bleeding wounds on the body of Kazakhstani soil. They were also aware that many generations of people living here would become victims of the nuclear test site. One rare confession was made in the last interview of academic Saharov. We had the possibility of developing new types of nuclear weapons informed by the underground tests. In practice, these completely exclude the possibility of atmospheric contamination with radioactive products, which means that those thousands and tens of thousands of human lives that paid for nuclear tests will now stop paying. However, the truth about the Semipalatinsk test site was gradually becoming evident. It was learned that even underground explosions were accompanied with leaks of radioactive gases in the air above the ground, causing horrendous damage to the people and to the environment. One such leak took place at the end of 1989. A report about it caused a public explosion. A meeting was held in front of the House of Literary People in Almaty, which put a start to the international anti-nuclear movement Nevada Semipalatinsk, headed by the poet and public figure Oljas Suleymenov. People demanded a stop to this long-term Cold War. The entire country was seized with the same mood. No to nuclear tests and no to atomic weapons. We kept quiet for a long time and even the first appeal was heard. People gathered for the first appeal. Campaigners for a nuclear-free world offered their hands of friendship to their counterparts from the US state of Nevada. The main and common goal included closing not only the Semipalatinsk test site, but all test sites in the world. Two million Kazakhs signed up to the appeal to close nuclear test sites. Of course, military hawks from the Ministry of Defense saw the rise in public anger, but the Soviet governmental machine was still powerful enough to resist pressure from the anti-nuclear alliance. Americans made 1,701 explosions. The last one was on the 27th of June. We have not been testing for a year and a half. We are falling behind them. Some prohibit testing at the Semipalatinsk site, others on Novaya Zemlya. Where do you suggest we do it? People cannot develop their own attitude out of the blue, especially one like this. To create a unanimous opinion in people, it has to be directed, managed. The Nevada movement is misdirected because it is first most against the test site. And this is, as we say, too narrow, really unpatriotic. We have only sustained and are conducting the most necessary tests now, the ones that are vital for the state, the most essential. We certainly cannot cease the tests completely now. 
The demand to immediately stop nuclear explosions seems quite unreasonable and, I would say, even, to a certain extent, perilous. They have driven people to paranoia, as in Nazi Germany, convincing them of all they say. They say that thousands of children were ill, as if it means they really were ill. As a professional, I can say that from the radiation point of view, at present, with modern methods of explosions that we are doing there, the test site is harmless. A certain force was needed that could give a fitting rebuff to the military-industrial complex and close the nuclear site. And this force appeared in the form of the first president of Kazakhstan. Despite pressure by the communist government of the Soviet Union and the security, defense and law enforcement agencies, despite the tempting prospect to keep Kazakhstan in the list of nuclear powers, Nursultan Nazarbayev firmly took responsibility and announced that the test site was to be closed. And on the 29th of August, 1991, the page of nuclear history, perhaps the most tragic in the history of Kazakh people, was turned. Representatives of the military-industrial complex of the former USSR continued attempts to start explosions again, requested to explode just three, just two, just one nuclear charge in order to complete experiments. But we remained adamant that was the will and the mood of our people. The example of Kazakhstan was followed by other countries. Tests on American nuclear sites in the state of Nevada were suspended. The main proponents of the most powerful nuclear test site, the Semipalatinsk death test site, fell silent and stopped their activities. Here, where, in the opinion of the military, the explosions had a minimum influence on the environment, the lunar landscape of the Yucca Flat area was entirely streaked with craters caused by hundreds of nuclear explosions. After Nevada, Explosions died down in the Novaya Zemlya, new ground test site in Russia, and then on the French site, Mururoa. The last nuclear site to suspend its tests was the nuclear site at Lob Nor in China. At that moment, the USA and the Soviet Union had more than 20,000 nuclear charges. By declaring a halt to nuclear tests at this time, Kazakhstan showed great courage. It was not easy for independent Kazakhstan to make its first independent steps, to recognize and start correcting mistakes made during its totalitarian past. But after the collapse of the Soviet Union, about 1,500 warheads were located in the territory of Kazakhstan the fourth largest, by its destructive capacity, nuclear arsenal in the world. The will of the Kazakhstani people, who opposed again and again the deadly test sites, appeared to be stronger than the military lobby. Nursultan Nazarbayev understood it well enough. There could not be an alternative to a nuclear-free status for Kazakhstan. Our country refused, voluntarily, the fourth largest nuclear arsenal in the world, and realizing our global responsibility towards the world, we made the only right decision. After the test site closed, Kazakhstan faced a problem. What should be done with a nuclear legacy, including 100 CC-18 missiles and 1,500 nuclear warheads? Some politicians and the military claimed the arsenal should be kept to guarantee the country's security. But this would, of course, compromise diplomatic negotiations on the issue of nuclear non-proliferation. Moreover, retaining the arsenal might encourage so-called threshold states to develop new bombs. In 1992, the member countries of the nuclear club wanted to insist on the full disarmament of Kazakhstan without providing something in its place. However, the position of the Kazakhstani government was firm and definite. Disputes arose concerning every issue, every point of the agreement on security guarantees for Kazakhstan, 
it was difficult to reach agreement in negotiations. Only after the heads of governments of the nuclear club countries signed the agreement in 1994 in Budapest was the withdrawal of all nuclear weapons from the territory of Kazakhstan completed. On the 31st of May, 1995, the last nuclear charge was destroyed on the former Semipalatinsk test site in the Degelen Mountains. The destruction was performed without a nuclear reaction using a simple explosive. Having refused the threatening legacy of the Soviet era, Kazakhstan chose the nuclear-free world once and for all. A sobering experience for me to stand on the ground zero where so many nuclear tests uh, were conducted. I was told 456 nuclear tests were conducted here uh, with a terrible effect on human lives and environmental consequences. Uh, we should not uh, repeat this kind of uh, legacy. This is an awful legacy and in that regard I highly commend the extraordinary leadership of President Nazarbayev of Kazakhstan who courageously closed this nuclear test site and initiated a nuclear weapon free zone in Central Asia. That's a big milestone. The United States provided real assistance in the withdrawal of thousands of nuclear warheads and the destruction of hundreds of intercontinental missiles, underground bunkers and command centers. In 1992, Kazakhstan started implementing a program designed by Senators Nunn and Lugar, known as the Nuclear Threat Initiative. A full program of measures was implemented for the destruction, the infrastructure decontamination, the disassembling of strategic armament systems, and the establishment of an expert control system. President Nazarbayev was a remarkable uh, display of courage and leadership and in basically set the example for the other countries in the former Soviet Union and I think also for the world. I'm not sure how tough it was because he was so committed. He was committed because he knew what the testing had done in uh, Kazakhstan. He knew that Kazakhstan people, the public health had deteriorated because of all the testing. He knew that nuclear weapons were extremely dangerous. He knew that it would create tensions with Russia, with the United States, with others. And so it was a courageous decision, but he had no doubts about it. He was convinced, and him being convinced not only helped other countries follow the example, but it helped those of us in the United States that were trying to make sure that we continued the program called Non Luger in terms of supporting the Senate and the House. <laughs> Nazarbayev is a very wise and brave person. I should note, if Gorbachev had conducted himself correctly, if he had persuaded Nazarbayev to become the Prime Minister after Roshkov, then many things would have turned out differently, probably. Unfortunately, history cannot be changed. That is why I have already told you that his personal role in this is huge because this event requires personal willful intervention and requires faithfulness to the idea, all the events related to the position. I remember we met with him and discussed the issues of the nuclear situation in Kazakhstan. That was a difficult decision too, very difficult. And closing the nuclear test site was not an easy decision, but a very wise one. Gorbachev was always maneuvering, that was the trouble. And of course, he had already lost his political will, and in addition, his personal character was not what was needed, not adequate. <laughs> it was not simply having the nuclear weapons removed from Kazakhstan and returned you know, to Russia or brought to Russia. 
It was also the elimination of the nuclear test site, the elimination of weapon-grade materials that might uh, be a security risk, uh, the service provided by Kazakhstan to other countries to eliminate their weapon-grade material and reduce uh, its enrichment, uh, the, uh, the work that was done at the uh, uh, Oktau uh, uh, reactor. I mean, there's so many examples that, uh, you know, this is a, a, a great uh, model for other countries. Uh, and I think it's uh, very much to uh, the credit of Kazakhstan to have taken these steps. And I think it's recognized. It, it is always appreciated in the United States and I think around the world. For 40 years, our people were hostages of a global nuclear confrontation. The closing of the Semipalatinsk test site and refusal to develop nuclear weapons became the first message of independent Kazakhstan to the whole of humankind with a sustainable platform for new initiatives in the making of a nuclear-free world. Having refused voluntarily the nuclear arsenal and proactively joined activities for ensuring nuclear security in the Asia region, Kazakhstan proposed a number of initiatives for the establishment of a nuclear-free global system. The United Nations organizations highly appreciated the results of these activities and, in 2009, supported the president of Kazakhstan's initiative to announce August 29th as the International Day of Nuclear Disarmament. Having entered the world community as a new state with a peaceful policy, Kazakhstan immediately gained the trust and respect of the whole world. This was reinforced at the Washington Summit of Heads of States concerning issues of nuclear security. Barack Obama remarked that Nazarbayev is a true example for world leaders in issues of nuclear non-proliferation and nuclear security. At this summit, President Nazarbayev reminded everyone, once again, for the need to create a new universal treaty on non-proliferation of nuclear weapons, a treaty that should guarantee no double standards, that would clearly articulate the obligations of all parties and liabilities for breaching the treaty. And first of all, this refers to the member states of the nuclear club. If all countries united and guaranteed to the rest of the world security from nuclear weapons and security in the general sense of the word, then it would be possible to make others refuse developments. Those who wish would refuse this as well under the guarantee of the UN Security Council. The Treaty on Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons presently existing appears to be ineffective, to say the least. Even those countries which have signed and ratified this treaty have breached it by creating nuclear weapons. These are India and Pakistan, as you know. And there are about 20 states at the threshold. That is why I propose to renovate this treaty. It must be binding. Kazakhstan is, step by step, persuading remaining nuclear powers to refuse to further increase futile nuclear weapons. With the assistance of Kazakhstan, the areas free of nuclear weapons include all populated parts of the Southern Hemisphere, Central Asia and Mongolia. To a certain extent, this guarantees regional security. The threat of an uncontrollable expansion of nuclear powers is one of the most serious challenges of the present day. Kazakhstan, through example, demonstrates to such countries as North Korea and Iran that in today's world, a state can progress without nuclear weapons. Rapid economic growth, domestic political stability, interconfessional accord, tolerance, 
leadership in the Central Asia region, responsible policies. These are all achievements of Kazakhstan today. Twenty years have passed since the closing of the Semipalatinsk nuclear test site. A new generation has grown up in the country unaware of nuclear explosions. Young Kazakhstani people are studying in the best universities in the world. They become highly qualified specialists, gifted musicians, sports people. They are the future of this powerful state. They are self-confident. They and their children have a future because their forefathers made the right decision at a critical moment in the country's history. This country has chosen life.